I'd like to dedicate this craft talk to Robin. <laughs> um, does everybody have a copy of this? I mean, you, you know, you know if the person next to you has it, that's probably sufficient, you know. Um, can everybody hear me all right, too? I'm gonna, I will probably wander back and forth. I, I, I tend to talk in motion. So, can you hear me now? It's <laughs> a better question. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, thanks. Um, uh, was, uh, when I was preparing for this, this talk, I, I, uh, I remembered last year's uh, craft talks, and uh, a couple things occurred to me. The first was that last year, um, Lee Abbott wore a Hawaiian shirt, and I, I thought it looked just, you know, sensational, and gave his talk a kind of, kind of casual clout that I don't <laughs> normally have, so there you go. Um, the second thing... Um, I noticed that was that um, last year all of my colleagues seemed actually a little bit nervous, oddly enough, about about giving their craft talks, especially after after Monday when Kelly Cherry got up and for those of you who might remember this, gave this highly polished, very crafted essay full of many wisdoms on the subject of narrative authority. And I was I was sitting in the audience and I. We were all sort of looking at each other, the other faculty members, and we were all thinking the same terrifying thought. She's prepared. <laughs> so um, I think I, I, the next, I went, as, as this year, uh, so last year, I went second, and I won, I think, many uh, points of friendship and collegiality right out of the gate by giving what was absolutely the most vulgar and lowbrow craft talk of all time <laughs> in which I reduced, you know, the sweep of narrative art to a bunch of pictures out of my high school geometry textbook. Um, and, uh, you know, how could, I, how could I not try to do that again, you know? Um, so you will find, those of you who were here last year, you will see that there is... Um, there's a little bit of familiar material here. Some of it is, is, is new. It's all sort of recast slightly in light of the, the story that I, that I gave you. Um, but in any event, this is stuff that I can always stand to hear myself say again. And I mean that seriously. I, when I say this stuff, I remember what it is that I'm doing. I forget. And the, um, the basic structural paradigms of narrative are something that it, it, you, just, you, you can never stray too far from them and not get lost. Uh, I also considered, uh, last year I didn't have a title for my address, you know, I thought that's sort of, too, after, that's sort of too bad, you know, an address, you know, a craft talk should have a title, so. This year I thought, you know, I thought, spent some time thinking about this, and I, you know, I considered a few, I considered something like, you know, patterns in narration, you know, that sort of alert you to what I'm doing, or essential formulas in fiction. <laughs> Fiction numerology, <laughs> three acts, the rule of the threes, and the best fourth thing, which <laughs> we hear about. And I kind of liked the last one, but none of them really captured the true lowbrow spirit of my enterprise. So here with my craft talk, which I am calling the pup tent that saved my life, or getting jiggy with structure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the first thing I want to do is just sort of shoot this story out into the air. Uh, it's John Cheever's reunion. It's uh, a story some of you uh, know. Um, and in fact, I was just talking to Lee about this. Richard Ford, the writer Richard Ford, in his new collection, Multitude of Sins, actually has this story. I think it was published in The New Yorker, as this one was. Um, that is a kind of response or homage to this story. And I, the, I meet a lot of writers who think this is in some way an important story to them. This one was for me. This is one of the first real stories that I read and loved, sort of on its own terms. I actually read it in high school. And when I came in, Bruce said, I love this story. It reminds me of the high school where he taught and I went. So um, anyway, um, it's a good story, and I use it for that. But it's also sh very short, and, uh, and I can read it fast, and we will all have a common text, which is really why I've given it to you. I've also never read it aloud before, so I'll probably not do that great a job. I thought about using the the affected British accent that Cheever used in later life, but, you know, I was just getting away. So imagine that I'm Cheever for a minute. All right. The last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. I was going from my grandmother's in the Adirondacks to a cottage on the Cape that my mother had rented, and I wrote my father that I would be in New York between trains for an hour and a half and asked if we could have lunch together. 
His secretary wrote to say that he would meet me at the information booth at noon, and at 12 o'clock sharp, sharp, I saw him coming through the crowd. He was a stranger to me. My mother divorced him three years ago, and had, I hadn't been with him since. But as soon as I saw him, I felt that he was my father, my flesh and blood, my future and my doom. I knew that when I was a grown man, I would be something like him. I would have to plan my campaigns within his limitations. He was a big, good-looking man, and I was terribly happy to see him again. He struck me on the back and shook my hand. Hi, Charlie, he said. Hi, boy. I'd like to take you up to my club, but it's in the 60s, and if you have to catch an early train, I guess we better get something to eat around here. He put his arm around me, and I smelled my father the way my mother sniffs a rose. It was a rich compound of whiskey, aftershave lotion, shoe polish, woolens, and the rankness of a mature male. I hoped that someone would see us together. I wished that we could be photographed. I wanted some record of our having been together. We went out of the station and up a side street to a restaurant. It was still early and the place was empty. The bartender was quarreling with the delivery boy and there was one very old waiter in a red coat down by the kitchen door. We sat down and my father hailed the waiter in a loud voice. And I, some of the, these words are actually ones I cannot say correctly. Kelner, he shouted, garçon, come here, you. His boisterousness in the empty restaurant seemed out of place. Could we have a little service here, he shouted. Chop, chop. Then he clapped his hands. This caught the waiter's attention, and he shuffled over to our table. Were you clapping your hands at me, he asked. Calm down, calm down, sommelier, my father said. If it isn't too much to ask you, if it wouldn't be too much above and beyond the call of duty, we would like a couple of beef eater Gibsons. I don't like to be clapped at, the waiter said. I should have brought my whistle. My father said, I have a whistle that is audible only to the ears of old waiters. Now, take out your little pad and your little pencil and see if you can get this straight. Two Beefeater Gibsons. Repeat after me. Two Beefeater Gibsons. I think you'd better go somewhere else, the waiter said quietly. That, said my father, is one of the most brilliant suggestions I have ever heard. Come on, Charlie, let's get the hell out of here. I followed my father out of that restaurant into another. He was not so boisterous this time. Our drinks came, and he cross-questioned me about the baseball season. He then struck the edge of his empty glass with his knife and began shouting again, Garçon, Calmier, Calmieri, you! Could we trouble you to bring us two more of the same? How old is the boy? the waiter asked. That, my father said, is none of your goddamn business. I'm sorry, sir, the waiter said, but I won't serve the boy another drink. Well, I have some news for you, my father said. I have some very interesting news for you. This doesn't happen to be the only restaurant in New York. They've opened another on the corner. Come on, Charlie. He paid the bill, and I followed him out of that restaurant into another. Here the waiters wore pink jackets like hunting coats, and there was a lot of horse tack on the walls. We sat down, and my father began to shout again. Master of the hounds! Tally ho and all that sort of thing. We'd like a little something in the way of a stirrup cup, namely two beef eater Gibsons. Two beef eater Gibsons? The waiter asked, smiling. You know damned well what I want, my father said angrily. I want two beef eater Gibsons and make it snappy. Things have changed in jolly old England, so my friend the Duke tells me. Let's see what England can produce in the way of a cocktail. <laughs> this isn't England, the waiter said. <laughs> Don't argue with me, my father said. Just do as you're told. I just thought you might like to know where you are, the waiter said. <laughs> if there's one thing I cannot tolerate, my father said, it is an impudent domestic. Come on, Charlie. The fourth place we went to was Italian. Buongiorno, my father said. Per favore, possiamo avere due co cocktail americani. Forti, forti, molto gin, poco vermouth. I don't understand Italian, the waiter said. <laughs> Oh, come off it, my father said. You understand Italian, and you know damn well you do. Vogliamo due cocktail americani stupido. The, father, the waiter left us and spoke with the captain, who came over to our table and said, I'm sorry, sir, but this table is reserved. All right, my father said, get us another table. All the tables are reserved, the captain said. I get it, my father said. You don't desire our patronage. Is that it? Well, the hell with you. Vada al inferno. Let's go, Charlie. I have to get my train, I said. I'm sorry, Sonny, my father said. I'm terribly sorry. He put his arm around me and pressed me against him. I'll walk you back to the station. If there had only been time to go up to my club. That's all right, Daddy, I said. I'll get you a paper, he said. I'll get you a paper to read on the train. Then he went up to a newsstand and said, Kind sir, will you be good enough to favor me with one of your goddamned no-good 10-cent afternoon papers? 
The clerk turned away from him and stared at a magazine cover. Is it asking too much, kind sir, my father said. Is it asking too much for you to send me one of your disgusting specimens of yellow journalism? I have to go, Daddy, I said. It's late. Now, just wait a second, Sonny, he said. Just wait a second. I want to get a rise out of this chap. Goodbye, Daddy, I said. And I went down the stairs and got my train. And that was the last time I saw my father. All right. Um, it, it reads pretty well. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, draw a couple of pictures on the board real fast. Yeah, I know these by heart, but I don't want to show anything. And like, sheer anxiety is giving me all. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the advantages I think I have as, as a teacher of imaginative writing is that um, I was very bad until very recently as a writer. Um, I think I was bad until about 1995. Um, and the reason that I was bad as a writer was that I had forgotten um, uh, this is the, uh, the, the basic structural paradigm under which I was operating. I was under the mistaken impression that uh, narrative was something that had a structure. Narrative is not something that has a structure in the same sense that you are not a person who has organs. Narrative is a structure. It's only form that gives some kind of shapeliness to the very cluttered energies of the imagination. The model on the left here is a model of narration that was the one I had been operating with since sometime probably in late junior high school. I've altered it slightly to make it a little more coherent, but sometime in late junior high school, or perhaps early high school, I don't remember, somebody told me that narrative had five parts, right? Situation, complication, rising action, climax, denouement, right? And that the energy of narrative, and this is the part I've added, they didn't tell me this in junior high, right? Was essentially an accumulation of change over time, change over time. All of which is sort of true, but all of which was useless to me as a writer because that is essentially what happens to readers. It's not a maker's tool. It's actually a critic's tool. And I thought for a long time that it was a maker's tool. It really isn't because, among other things, it suggests that literature is, is, is made in a linear manner, and it's not. I don't write in a linear way. And in fact, most stories that I love have considerable complexities that make them nonlinear at some level. It's not a good maker's tool. This is a good maker's tool, at least it was for me, and this is the thing that saved my life. This is the puff tent that saved my life in 1995. And it's cribbed from a bunch of places. I don't claim that any of this stuff is original. It's good because it's not. <laughs> um, this is the three-act model of narration. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through Cheever's story and talk about the act structure and how it works specifically in his, and you can see how this is not actually a very simplistic and formulaic thing. It begins that way and then becomes quite surprising and rich. But here's the short version of the three-act structure and how it operates. I do not think of these, this is, I, this is the, the big difference, is that this is a line and these are enclosed spaces, okay? These are volumes of writing, volumes of information, and they can actually be dispersed in different ways across the narrative. <laughs> but somewhere in your narrative, you have a first act. It's approximately a quarter of a narrative. This is actually true. Right? It sounds very formulaic, but it's a quarter. It can be less, and in fact, the shorter a narrative is, the more the first act and the third act tend to be elided. 
but about a quarter of your energy as a writer when you're making a well-made narrative is devoted essentially to orientation, and that's what the first act is. It's the basic orienting information of a narrative. It concludes when you hit something called plot point one, and that's actually a term heard from, sorry, from Hollywood, um, which fetishizes this all out of proportion, but it's still valuable information. The first plot point is kind of a stake that separates these spaces, and it's the first truly interesting event in a narrative that begins to answer the fundamental question every story must answer, which is, why this day? What makes this worthy of being a story? Why is this day more interesting than other days? The second act, which occupies roughly half of your narrative space, is the, the great body of your story. It's the unfolding of events as a consequence of the instability that is introduced by the first plot point. The second plot point is rather like the first. Yet again, another very interesting event, more interesting than, the, than all others except for plot point one, that takes the story and turns it towards resolution and exit. Okay, when I say exit, I really mean that. Somebody leaves at the end of the story. The interesting question is who, and I'll get to that. Right? But at the end of the story, everybody goes home. Right? And you've got to get them to the exit. There has to be a natural sense of closure. Right? So the second plot point is another large event that steers us towards resolution and exit. And it can be quite short. Um, and it's, it, it, it's never longer than a quarter. If it's longer than a quarter, you've got a problem. Right? You've got a problem. Right? That's the basic model. Um, the things to remember is that this is essentially a model of spaces, not order of information. In fact, it tends to behave as order of information, but it needn't. And that's one of the fundamental differences between this and this model, which, by the way, this is the Elizabethan model for five-act drama. That's what it is. I have not, I, I don't write five-act plays. I write stories and novels. So that's another reason why this works a little bit better for me. Okay, what I want to do is, is uh, sort of go back through this. I just gave you the rough outline of this, and then kind of go into more detail about these things, because a lot of other issues get raised along the way. So we're going to go to Act 1, and we'll use a bunch of other stories that I'll mention, but we're going to specifically use Cheever's Reunion. Okay. The goal of Act 1, as I said, is orientation. That's the big word. It's all the orienting information of the story that has to do with um, uh, light, weather, time of day, where we are, what are the basic rules of the world that we are inhabiting, um, anything that merely gives the reader comfort at the outset of a story. It's also structural orientation. What's my point of view going to be? First person, third person, what kind of verb tense structures are being employed, what is the relationship between the telling and the tale and time. This stuff is all subtle. It's stuff that readers pick up subconsciously, but it's absolutely the most important kind of orienting information. What are the structural paradigms of this story? It usually takes the form of some kind of initial exposition. But the first act tends to have the feel of initial exposition to orient us to the story's landscape of fact and feeling. Now, this does not mean that you have to begin every story you ever want to write or every novel you, you want to write with, with roughly a quarter of its length, whatever that is, uh, summarizing all the social and geographical and meteorological realities of the world that you are inventing. It means that some of that information finds its way in and it finds its way in early. There are lots of ways to imply it. There are lots of ways to disperse it. A good example, one of the best examples of dispersed first act is a story that I think I mentioned last year. And it used to be a story that actually everybody read, and it's not anymore. It's a story A&P by John Updike. And uh, it's a great teaching story. It used to be in every anthology, so I could sort of rely on it. It's a real old saw. But it's a story about a kid in the early 60s, just before, it's sometime between, you know, sometimes just before the Cuban Missile Crisis. You can sort of date the story that way. He works in a grocery store in A&P in northern Massachusetts. And uh, it's a sort of a, it's a working class town with a, with a fancy summer colony nearby. And it's the summer and the kid's working in this lousy, you know, A&P, you know, stranded, surrounded by, you know, crap and cellophane, as he calls it, uh, wearing a little clip-on bow tie that he doesn't even own. It's the stores. He's working at his, re at his register. The story begins this way, though. I'm working at my register when in walks these three girls in nothing but bathing suits. All right? For a second, those girls are actually naked in the sentence because they're wearing nothing but bathing suits. 
So that's your first plot point right there. It's in the, you know, the, it's in the first sentence. You can say the first act is I'm working at my register. The one clause is the first act of that story. But over the next, say, thousand words or so of this story, Updike's pretty careful to give us uh, a sense of who Sammy is before and without the girls. And that's your act one orienting information. Because, of course, they are the disruption in his life. They are the thing that comes in and confuses him and makes him unsatisfied with his lot. In fact, the, end, the day ends up being a pretty special day for Sammy, that's his name, uh, as a consequence of these girls' arrival. So the first act in that story is both implied by his surprise at these girls. Why should it be so interesting for them? Well, it's because his life is so sterile, right? So it's implied. And it's also dispersed across the next 1,000 words. Sometimes it's tucked in through flashbacks. Sometimes readers will just simply put things out of order and create a kind of, uh, sorry, movie term, Karen. Boy, I, said, I feel so awful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but sometimes the narrative will simply reverse itself to give you act one orienting information. Um, and sometimes this is done actually for, to hilariously comic effect. I would warn you against doing this one too blithely because it's the trick of pulp novelists. So that, that awful thing that she read yesterday, I'm sure it began this is the, the classic opening sentence of bad pulp crime noir, is one which uses, uh, that uses flashback for the, for the first act. Bang, 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 four shots ripped through my body, and I was off on the greatest adventure of my life. But first, let me tell you about myself. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. And, and how many of you got the really awful advice, you've got to get your reader's attention right away? Okay. So you can do this, but you know, be careful. Sometimes the first act is actually dramatic as opposed to exposition. Dramatic means it's a scene in which things are actually happening as opposed to sentences that summarize information. Right? And that, that can work well, too. Um, you can use a scene to do this. It's a little more cumbersome. But I, want, I don't want you to feel like you have to have this stuff simply summarized in a story. But here's the most important rule of the first act. This is the thing you really get. The rest of you actually knew. You didn't, you know, maybe you had never articulated to yourself. Maybe you had. But you, you certainly did know it at some level if you have written at all. Everybody knows that a narrative's got to give people like, a little bit of help at the front. Here's the most important thing about the first act, and I call it the certainty principle. Right? And this requires, again, that I sort of open up the discussion to another idea. Here's what I mean. Whenever we're writing, we're actually negotiating three different trains of thought at least. There are three minds moving when we are negotiating a narrative, when we're writing one, when we're constructing one. One train of thought is the main character or characters. There's some invented person whose train of thought is part of the narrative. There's the reader's train of thought. The reader's sitting there reading a story. They exist in real physical and biological time, and they have a train of thought. Something is happening to their mind while they're reading the story. And it's your job to, in a sense, I don't want to say control that, because that sounds like something a CIA operative would do, but you know, to guide that you know, usefully and kindly. The third is something that I call, not entirely originally, the story mind. The story mind. I'll get to that in a second. Okay? First is the characters. Generally, this is what happens to characters in a story. Your main character becomes more certain about something by the end of a story. That's the general motion of that train of thought. Your main character will learn and grow the axis of change like a good primate over the course of a story, even if what they learn is how stupid they are. All right? And somebody used the word epiphany in yesterday's craft talk. You know, I'm not a big believer in epiphanies per se, I don't like to use that word as much as some other people do, but I do, because I, I like to, I, I think of it as more slow, more slow than that. And, you know, Joyce used to just sort of shove the big moment in. I can't, I can't get away with it. Um, but yeah, they learn and they grow. That's what happens. There's a train of thought that moves from uncertainty to certainty. The, the uncertainty is actually created by the first plot point, but that's, I don't want to get, I don't want to get off track here. All right? So the main character begins the story with a problem, and to some extent that problem is solved or at least fathomed by the end. Now, this may create fresh uncertainties that travel beyond the end of the story, but by the end, something like knowledge has flown into the main character. So again, from uncertainty to certainty. That's the motion of a character's train of thought. Okay, now I'm going to do this out of order and say what a story mind is. Okay? You can think of the story mind, if you want to, as the writer. Right? I am the story mind. Right? And that's, okay, that's fair enough. 
But I think this causes some problems. I think because the writer is an imperfect version of the story mind. I, you know, I think the perfect story is written by the writer who has perfectly inhabited the story mind. I don't think you can do that, right? The story mind is more of an idea. I also don't think of the story mind as the narrator, which is, is, is very problematic. It's, it certainly doesn't work in first, because that's a character. And even in third, it doesn't work particularly well, because the narrator is, is more of a mediating intelligence between the story mind and the reader. I think of the story mind as this. It is the repository of all information about the story and the imagined world in which it is occurring. It is the final perfect shape of the story inside the slab of rock, and I'm trying to chip it out. It is completely extemporal. It exists outside the flow of time so that it knows, for instance, the end before the beginning because it's disobedient to time. It knows the heart's truth of every character absolutely better than the characters know themselves. It knows the story's dramatic direction in its totality. And it knows every physical detail of the story's imagined world of feeling and fact. It's not God, but it is a God. And it's therefore 100% certain at all times. 100% certain at all times. So you've got the character moving from uncertainty to certainty, and you have the story mind, 100% certainty, every moment. For readers, the, qu the equation is a little more complex. We begin reading a story in a state of absolute uncertainty. We know nothing at all. Across the story's distance, though, we want to learn some things while being kept in the dark about others. This is conventionally known as suspense. This is my 18th year as a teacher, and so it's probably something of a professional contamination that I think of it this way, but I've come to see what happens to readers in it of a well-made story as rather like what happens to students in a well-taught class. Every new certainty creates a fresh uncertainty so that readers, students, are pulled forward by this carefully engineered combination of what they know and what they do not yet know, while also feeling the comforting presence of this other entity, the teacher, the story mind, that knows everything. So again, characters move from uncertainty to certainty. Story mind, 100% certain at all times. Readers exist in a constant play between the two, being pulled forward by uncertainty, being pushed from behind by certainty. Uncertainty pulls them forward, certainty pushes them forward. So how does this apply to the first act? In general, the first act is one in which the reader's initial uncertainty about everything is comforted by the presence of the story mind working to create a stable reality that they can inhabit. That is the real job of the first act, to put the reader at her ease. The voice of the tale communicates this stability through a careful delineation of the reality of the, of the story world. It alerts us conscientiously to where we are, who the characters are, what the story's basic impulses are in terms of length, language, content, and so forth. Right? So the first act is one in which the reader and the story mind are essentially getting to know one another. Let me give you an example of this idea of certainty and uncertainty working together. This is a, the first sentence of a novel that some of you will recognize immediately. It is, I think, one of the best first sentences of any novel that I've read. It was a bright, cold day in April, and all the clocks were striking 13. Does anybody recognize this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 1984, right? All right. Now, what does this sentence do? As if this is the first sentence, so it's a fundamental orienting sentence. This is the first acquaintanceship between the reader and the story. All right? What does it give you? It gives you the, the weather. Right? It gives you the weather report. That's a good thing to get. Right? You plop somebody down and imagine the reality. You've got to tell them how to dress. <laughs> yeah? So it gives us weather, bright, cold day in April. It gives us the time of year. It gives us the location. How does it do that? It was a bright, cold day in April, and all the clocks were striking 13. How does it tell you what kind of place you're in? Forget the 13. Before you get to that. Uh, what's that? Okay, gives you the Northern Hemisphere, sure. How do you know that you're in a city, though? It's a place with several public clocks, right? It's a place with lots of public clocks, right? So it gives you even a sense of the kind of city you're in. And of course, you're in some, some version of London. But it just, you know, just the use of the plural there gives you a lot of information, okay? All that is, those, those, that's information that's full of certainty. It's very, very comforting. Then you get a piece of uncertainty, 
right? And all the clocks were striking 13. That's a fact. It's information. It gives you something, but what it's really giving you is a question. Why are we on military time? You know, what kind of and you immediately know, okay, we're in a state of siege. We're in a police state. Something like that. You start rapidly calculating this reality, but it leaves a gap. Right? Why are we on military time? So that, of course, is the vacuum that you then chase into the rest of the novel. And I think it's such a propulsively constructed first sentence that that initial vacuum really shoots you all the way to the end of the book. Cheever's first act. Go back to the Cheever. I did read it for a reason, not just because I like it. <laughs> right. The first act of this story is obvious, right? If this initial exposition, okay, it's very clear what he's laying out, right? He, who his family are, the history, there's a divorce, he hasn't seen his father in three years, he's going to go to Grand Central Station. Again, light weather, time of year, it's summer at the cottage, dad is a secretary, you are filling in the gaps really fast. What isn't there is still there. But there is a clock striking 13 in this opener as well. And again, it's in the first sentence. The last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. What is the uncertainty built into that sentence? Students in my workshop should know by now. What's that? What about last? What about lastness? Right, yeah, it, what does it mean? It's an ambiguous, it's ambiguous diction, right? Last can mean two things. It can mean final or it can mean most recent, very simply, right? Is this the final time he saw his father, or is this the most recent? Unconscious, you don't recognize this consciously as you're reading the story. It's just a piece of unconscious information that gets tucked into your brain for the duration of the story, right? It's a mystery that you're chasing. Now, there are some other uncertainties that just get you to the next sentence, right? The last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. Okay, who's traveling where? Why this meeting place? Is somebody going on a train, right? It sort of, you know, just drops you in the middle of a journey, just like, you know, Hemingway tells like white elephants. Who's getting on what train where, right? You get that information in the next sentence. Cheever's smart. He solved that problem for you right away. But this other intriguing uncertainty is one you don't even know you have when you read the story the first time, and it is the most important feature of the entire story. Right? What is the meaning of the word last? Okay, plot point one in this story. Now, we could argue what the first plot point is, but just take my version of it for now. There are several answers to this. This is not a perfect model. You could say that it's something that I'm... You could say you have a different response to the story than I do, but um, I, have a, I have a sort of thesis that, that, that makes sense to me. Um, plot point one, something unexpected that sets the story in motion as a story. That's what the first plot point is. It's something, think of it as something that disrupts the plan of an ordinary day. Something that happens that makes the story story worthy. The other thing about the first plot point is it cannot be arbitrary. These, the most important events of the story are plot point one and plot point two, and they cannot be things sailing in from outer space. They have to fundamentally link character and events together to answer the question, why this day? I think it's very helpful to think of the first plot point as a specific challenge to this specific character. What is going to make this character have a story now? Not any character. Right? I'll give you an example that you all know. Here's a story. First act, you know what the first plot point is. An orphan girl goes wandering in the woods. She comes upon a house. She's an orphan, 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 orphan. Nice, tidy, domestic. Everything about the house calls out to her loneliness. Also, it's unlocked. <laughs> she enters the house committing a felony and sits down to eat. It's the three bears, I know, okay? But please note that unless she goes in the house, no story. It's just a walk in the woods, all right? Here's another example, and it's a story that I referred to last year, so it's a little more sophisticated, but you'll see the same principle. It's called The Expert on God by John LaRoe. A boy grows up to become a Jesuit, but he is plagued by doubts about every article of belief, the Eucharist, the virginity of Mary, the divinity of Christ, the whole ball of wax. These doubts have a complex effect on him. The more he doubts, the deeper it seems he is pulled into the priesthood, which is the arena in which he wrestles with his faithlessness. But at the same time, he is lonely and completely tormented and feels like a hypocrite. Eventually, he abandons all hope and just decides he's going to live his life as a fraud. One day, he says Mass. It's actually Christmas Day, and he drives home on the way he comes upon a car accident, a sports car has skidded off the road and smashed. No matter who he is at that moment, he has to get out of his car and do something. And in fact, this event is introduced into the narrative with a terrific sentence. It really says, hey, here's the first plot point. There's no reason to hide this. 
Yeah. All the exposition, what kind of man he was, how he grew up, that is where things stood with him on the day of the accident. Okay? <laughs> All right. So let's look at Shaver's reunion for a second. What's the first plot point? What's the event that pulls event and character together, right, and makes this a uh, story? Intrinsically, he's got a good event. He's sort of got an automatic first plot point. For my money, it's simply the fact that he meets his father at the station. It's not what happens at the restaurant yet. That's the other way to go about this, and that's a fair, that's a fair interpretation of this. But I think of it as simply meeting his father because of the language of this and because there's also a sense already of some formal disruption to his sense of organized plan. We can't go to my club, right? Dad says this several times in the story. It obviously is a problem for him, right? So he's going to have to improvise, and of course we immediately see the consequences of this improvisation. Obviously at his club, they don't act like this. Right. We can't go to my club, right? That's, a, that's really, for me, the first plot point, the fact that they come together and already there's imbalance, there's no safety. This sense of, of uh, potential disaster and agitation in the text is amplified by what, again, Charlie, the boy, says about the effect his father has on him at once, right? He is immediately vulnerable to a stranger. Right? And he's, in fact, more vulnerable than he could be to anybody in the whole world. He is my future and my doom. Right? His complete exposure, that's, for my money, the real first plot point. And it happens when Dad gives him a big hug and says, we can't go to my club. First plot point, okay? The story's underway. All right, the second act. Oh, boy, I got to hustle. Okay. Um, the second act of this is about half the story. This is the trickiest part of every story. If you're going to get lost in the woods and die, this is where you'll do it. <laughs> and this is why I do it when I fail. In general, act two is, you know, here's, the, here's a good definition of act two. A series of related events that directly follow from the disruption caused by plot point one. Right? It's an accumulation of tension leading to release, ultimately, that follows from the instability created by plot Point one. Now, we have to talk, though, for a second about this idea of related events. And I, I'm going to have to hustle this up. I'm going to have to give a somewhat abbreviated version of this because I see already that I've only got 20 minutes at the most. Okay? Understanding your second act is really mostly a matter of thinking about the ways in which events can be related. The second act is where the story accumulates tension scene by scene, and this accumulation actually can happen through three different kinds of relationships. So first, chronological. Scenes simply follow one another. Looks like this. A plus B plus C, right? Events follow one another. A happens and B happens and C happens. Right? Every story's got a chronology. This is omnipresent. The second, right, which is causal, right? A brings about B, brings about C. Is a way in which scenes can be related in the story. We see a scene that, in a sense, causes the next one. The last one, harmonic relationship, right? Where scenes repeat each other in some important form. This is the one I didn't notice until 1995. Right? A harmonic relationship where scenes create echoes with one another. They're in the story to amplify one another through, hate this term, it's always misused, but resonance. And here I mean a physical principle where sound waves hit one another and they amplify. Right? This effect done properly right, is more like that, where the accumulation becomes something much larger than simply a series of equivalencies. Okay? Charlie Baxter, the writer Charlie Baxter, calls this something called, called this rhyming action, and I really like that, where things in the story kind of rhyme with each other. We all know rhyme is more than just the two sounds sounding nicely. Right? It sort of explodes. And these kinds of rhymes explode. Okay. So let's go back to Cheever for a second. His second act. Right? It's, how is it organized? Obviously, it's chronological. This is always part of a story. We have a series in his second act of what? Four restaurants. Right? At which Dad does more or less the same thing with lightly retooled effects. Okay? The. Uh, the chronology of this story, in fact, is one, in, it, it's a very, very close chronology. This is an interesting story because it's almost like a single tracking shot, right? It takes you, um, 
how long to read the story? Maybe, you know, five minutes to read, five or ten minutes to read, and it, the story, the total story covers maybe an hour of time, right? This is about as close hauled as the story gets. There's a strong immediate sense of its chronology, the ratio of of uh, story cont time contained in the story to time required to read it is actually 10 to 1, right? Very, very close. You can't really get much closer than that, okay? So it has a chronological structure, a chronological organization. But here's the caveat. Chron chronological organization by itself accomplishes nothing in a story. It's merely an arrangement of events, right? It accumulates no particular meaning. A follows B follows C is a big so what. You need one or both of the other types of relationships to have something that is story worthy. So, the rest of the events in Shiva's story, do they cause one another or is it something else? In fact, cause and effect has nothing to do with this story because it's about a drunk. There is a cause and effect that takes place at the end, but not until. The second act is actually made up entirely of accumulated repetitions. Four restaurants each lightly retooled, different decor, slightly different set of insults leading to expulsion, all of which the son has to sit and take like a soldier shoved out of the trench. Okay? Now, here's the question. Why is it four? I think that's, once Cheever figured out how he's going to write this story, I think that's probably the only question he wrestled with. Why four? Why not two? Not enough. What, do you, what, what sort of seals the case? How about three? Okay. You've got, yeah, you've got to cover your tracks a little bit. Three is a little too neat. Yeah, yeah. By three, the case is proved. He's bad to waiters. Okay? He's not somebody that you want to go out for lunch with. All right? You know? Four both covers the, his tracks, hiding the threeness of things. Three bears, three, right? Three. Um, and it also does what the second act can do when you are a competent writer. Make the point and then hammer it in. <laughs> You know, shove a knife into the story, and he does, okay? Um, I was at this point going to give you another example of this. Do I have enough time to do it? Mm, no, I don't. Um, if you're interested, I'll, I'll show you how this can work over in a much longer narrative. But this idea of amplification, repetition, need not be so obvious as it is here. Do you want an example, go read? Sorry, I'm, I'm doing kind of an update cheaper thing today. I don't know why I'm just like all about, re you know, the stories of white guys and ties today. But um, <laughs> he wrote a wonderful story called Trust Me that I used to teach a lot. And it's a story, again, with four scenes, but they're spread out over 40 years. Where the same effect is accomplished and you wouldn't necessarily notice it. Trust Me by John Uplake. I recommend it. Okay. So that's our second act, right? Some level of repetition um, in this story right, that creates amplification, creates a kind of, again, resonance. Now, the second plot point, the second stake in the narrative. Right. Yet again, this is another you know, distinct event that pulls the story in another direction or at this point, and this is how I think of it, something that deepens its patterns. Right? Something here that's not really different, but it's more. Something exceptional. I would even go on to say that the second plot point is more important than the first because all stories are in a sense on probation until this moment. Why are they on probation? Because embedded in the second plot point is the possibility of outcome. The story starts heading to the door here, and unless the story can end, it's still not a story. Your second plot point seals the case. First plot point is a kind of bet that you placed on the table. I can find a story here. Second plot point is where the cards come down. To go back to the Cheever. All right, so the second plot point is something that amplifies the pattern. What is the second plot point? of Cheever's story. What is the second plot point? Here, I'll be interactive. What's that? The newspaper, right, the newsstand, right? That is clearly the second plot point. And you can see it's a amplifying disruption to the pattern that's been established. It's a version of what we've seen, only more so different, more interesting, right? It's made of the same material, and yet it's something different, okay? Now, the newsstand is interesting because it raises a, a, a bunch of, 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 of other issues. I mean, the new, why, why does the news, what does the newsstand do that the other, that the restaurants do not? Well, when it contains a confession of the pleasure he takes in this. We haven't really been able to see that completely yet. But think about, for Charlie, you know, what is, what is, what is, what is for Charlie, what does the newsstand do? Well, he's already discussed. Mm -hmm. And that's the first part. I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry. 
Apologies are meaningless, right? He's saying, I've got a deadline. It's the first time he inserts himself into the narrative and it causes no change whatsoever. What else? Yeah, it's, what, what is the one thing, though, that we don't yet know until he does it to the newsstand? It's, it's sort of obvious and maybe a little pedestrian, but it's important. It's not about the waiters, right. He does it to everybody. If he's done it to four waiters, we know absolutely he does it to waiters, but we haven't seen him do it to anybody else yet. Okay? To see him do it in another circumstance is important. Right? The case actually hasn't been sealed. We felt as if it was sealed. We had a certainty, right? but this other uncertainty, well, what ha does he do it to other people? And the answer is, yeah, you betcha, and he'll do it even when his kid is saying, I have to go, Daddy. Right? I have to go. It's sealed. It's over. That's the second plot point. Yes? And he might have done that to Okay. There's no question. All of a sudden, it contaminates his whole life, yeah. right? At that moment, it just it just widens like rings on a pond. It's everything, and it's intentional. And, it's intentional. and he does it for pleasure. What's that? Right. Yes. Boy is boy is invisible to him at that moment. Okay. So that's our second plot point. The third act. All right. Now remember, the third act is something that can be quite small, but every story still does have one. A quarter or less, in this case, a lot less. Notice how close we are to the end of the story. Okay? The Elizabethan model says that the third act is really something, is the denouement, the kind of uh, the, the moment in the story following the climax after which the consequences of the climax are made known. Nice like Elizabethan model. It doesn't really work for me because I never know what the climax is in my story. And I would imagine many of you do not either. I've never written a story where I said, here's the climax. Because you know what? It's not necessarily the second plot point. It's just not necessarily the second plot point. In fact, I had an awful time finding my way out of stories until I understood my third act this way. Not as a denouement, but in this manner. The story's terminal moment is one in which, is, is one which needs to contain its future. Right? The third act, the story's terminal moment, is one which needs to contain the story's future. I mentioned this earlier. I said, somebody exits at the end of a story. Guess who it is? It's the reader. The reader leaves the story world at its conclusion. The characters do not. And the story's last moment or moments need to embed these characters in a kind of permanent reality beyond the story itself. I, for years, was stumped by the question, how do I end a story? Students would ask me all the time, how do you know the story's over? Where's the, how do you find the ending? And it's when you find the moment that contains the story's future. Okay, Sheever's third act. We know it's, it's third act is the final sentence. Right? That's all we have left. But examining the final moment and its language reveals a kind of, a, a sort of interesting truth about the, sta the story and the way it has established its emotional stakes. Okay? Um, this is going to lead me to another idea, and I'm really pressed for time, so I'm going to have to move fast. All right? um, the one thing I like most about the three-act model is it reminds me that action, that events are always the basis of a narrative. Something has to happen in a story. Something has to happen. And there are three ways for things to happen. All that numerology again. There are three kinds of actions or events. Sorry, this is true. <laughs> Fixed actions. Fixed actions are those actions performed by a character as a matter of due course, as a matter of expression of who they are on a daily basis. I got up this morning and I brushed my teeth. I do it every morning. Classic fixed action. Shutting up through his father's tirade is a fixed action for Charlie. Doing nothing. That's what you do when you are the son of this man. That's what you do. He's been doing it all his life. He hasn't seen his dad for three years, but I promise you that's how things were before. Okay? Fixed action. Fixed action is not plot characterization. Received action. Received actions are those actions in the narrative of some weight that seem to require a response. There are things with kinetic energy that are actually not performed by the main character. So, the father's behavior in the restaurant is a received action for Charlie. Charlie's our main character. It's his arc that we are following in the story. When, this, when the dad acts like this, it is a received action for Charlie. And in his case, it's a brutally received action. It's rather like a series of blows that he is forced to take. Received action. They're plot, but they're only half the plot. The third kind of action is moving action. 
And I can't remember who came up with this term, why they call it moving action, but I like it. It makes a lot of sense to me. Moving actions are those actions performed by your main character that contain some dimension of choice, right? Where they choose to do something, and as a consequence, they change, the world changes, and they can't change back, right? Every story has to have at least one moving action or no story. It didn't happen. It's not a story without that. Your character has to move the action in addition to being moved by it. Has Charlie performed a moving action? Not until the last sentence. Okay? The reason the story isn't done is because Charlie hasn't done anything yet. Okay? Charlie needs to perform a moving action. Okay? So you think about the last sentence, and it's clear why it's there. It gives Charlie resolution, okay? And I got on the train, and that was the last time I saw my father, all right? But if you look at this sentence, a couple of things become clear. First of all, the getting on the trainness of it isn't as important as it might otherwise be. Yes, he chooses to do this. He leaves his father in midstream and just goes down the stairs. But this could be simple obedience to his schedule, another fixed action, another form of obedience to other people, right? not a deviation, not a deepening of his life, not a change from which he cannot change back, except for that second phrase, and that was the last time I saw my father. Is this a familiar sentence to you? Yes, the story started with this. Right? The essential uncertainty of the story, that wobbliness that's always been there in your unconscious, is finally addressed here, and it's addressed beautifully. What does last mean? Final. How do you know? What guarantees its finality? There's only one answer to this. Now, what in the world guarantees the finality? You will never see somebody again because they are dead. Right? The story contains the future. Dad has already died. This is the story's point of view. Right. Six events in the story. Uh, you stand, restaurant one, restaurant two, restaurant three, restaurant four. Um, sorry, this is the station, and then the, the station newsstand at the end. Those are the events of the story. Moving forward in time. Here's the moment of the story's telling. It exists sometime in the future. This is a first-person historical past tense narrative. Right? So the voice of the story, a grown man, reaches back to a moment in his life some time ago and recalls this in recent books in the order. One, two, three, four, five, six. He had known how the story ended before he started. Right? The story is not happening to him as, as he tells it. It happened <coughs> ago. Right? And the length of this of Jonas fundamental structural paradox of story that you have been wondering about the whole time without knowing how long ago was this. The size of that interval is part of the story. It's another uncertainty. Right? The last clause of the story tells you that size and tells you its nature and puts the future of the story in the story. This is the other event of the story. That is that. It's sometime in between these two. It turns out that this does not matter in terms of the number of years. Some number of years. Enough time. That is God. And, you know, I ask students sometimes, but I teach this story in the you know, college classes that I teach. I sometimes, you know, we read the story, and then I say, okay, everybody, take out a piece of paper. Don't cheat. Don't look at anybody else's piece of paper. I want you to write down the answer to this question. I just heard the story. How does the father die? And half of my students know the trick question and write the correct answer, and that is, he dies alone. Even that is in the story. So but he dies alone. The future of the story is in the story. And I'm at 10, and that's the, that's the gist of my, my speech. <laughs> I have six more pages in another exercise, but maybe I'll do that next year. Um, I, Max, should I take questions? I don't know how you feel about the schedule. I, yeah, because I care more about the... Yeah, it's not a question, but I have a question. Um, I was wondering, if you were down the half hour that he had the station? The half hour that he's waiting for his father? Yeah, 
not abandoned, but sure. able to be unified. Now, you can take this model and move it over to different points of the story and get the same kind of thing. What you can't do is say the third act is anything other than the last sentence. Okay? <laughs> you can, it's very easy to, it's very easy. Third act of the story is begin the first act. It's sort of not quite clear where it ends. There'll be several different ways to interpret it. It doesn't matter. So as soon as the writer are confident about what, what you think it is, the story will proceed with confidence. I always feel like I know what it is. Other people are just going, no, no, it's something else. And I say, great, hey, that's not shit. Very <laughs> <laughs> quick. Yeah. Something of interest with kinetic energy that happens to your main character, usually requiring a response. Ooh, car accident. If you see a car accident, major car accident, alone, country road, what you do, even if you do nothing, right, is a choice you make. Right? So it, it, it has energy to it. It draws energy into your life and you have to act. There's those things that happen to you that force you to make some uh, decisions about who you are. Any chance of uh, getting your dependent? No. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 